Back in January, I crossed off a major bucket list item of mine, flying on the famous Honolulu to Guam milk run, operated by United Airlines now, previously operated by Continental Micronesia. A couple days before I posted this video, Noel Phillips posted the exact same journey, which is actually a great video, so go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. But I decided to wait a little bit before posting this one, but without further ado, welcome to Honolulu International Airport, where we're checking in at the United counters for our 15-hour economy journey on board an outdated 737-800. I was actually able to book this journey in economy for 60,000 United miles. Unfortunately, business class was way too expensive, whether in money or miles. But it still ended up being 100% sold out, basically, probably just because it only makes these five stops once per week. Now, United actually has specific lanes for check-in for their westbound flights from here. I'm assuming just because they're the only international flights United has out of Honolulu, and so they need to get all the document checks out of the way. Now interestingly enough, although Guam is a territory of the United States, this flight counts as an international flight due to our stops in the Marshall Islands at Majuro and Kwajalein, and Micronesia, with stops in Kosrae, Pompeii, and Shuk. While the full journey took about 16 hours, we were allowed breaks at all the stops, in theory, more on that later. But this flight actually has existed for quite a while and has quite a history, especially for the people that live on these islands. Now even though our flight is from the D gates, most United flights out of Honolulu depart from the G gates, so we're off to find the Honolulu United Club. Star Alliance Gold members can gain access on any international flight regardless of the cabin, but access to United clubs are notoriously difficult as they are membership only, meaning you can buy a one-time pass or an annual membership, but a first class ticket doesn't automatically get you access. This is only given on specific domestic routes and most international routes. This is due to reducing overcrowding in the lounges due to the large number of domestic flights with first class seats in United's network. The Honolulu United Club actually gets fairly busy in the late morning and early afternoon due to the multiple mainland bound flights, but at this hour I was only the second person in the lounge when I got there. I do like the look of this particular United Club. In my experience, United balls out when it comes to Polaris lounges, but their United Clubs have tended to be below standard in my opinion. This one however seems to be freshly remodeled with decor and dining options that fit the vibe of the islands. Things like Spam and Eggs, Lili Koi Loaf Bread rather than the infamous carrot sticks that we've seen in the other United clubs. And of course, you've got the famous Paso Guava that is a must if you are traveling to or from the islands instead of just orange juice or apple juice. I especially enjoyed the whole wall of cup noodles. I did end up being a bit hungry on the flight a couple times and regretted not getting a bit more food, but I don't typically eat much breakfast anyway. For some reason when traveling though, I find myself eating just for the principle. From the far end of the lounge, I found a bit more privacy once people began showing up. They also have it located in a great spot for ramp views, if only it weren't pitch black outside. Now due to the lounge being so far from our departure gate, I decided to head over to the gate early, leaving myself more than enough time. For those who are unfamiliar with the Hawaii airports, most of them are a 50-50 split roughly of inside and outside due to the tropical weather. So you will find most main walkways in open air, and then boarding areas and shops are in separate air conditioned sections. Honolulu Airport also offers a post-security inter-terminal shuttle, known as the Wiki Wiki Shuttle, which is essentially a bus that takes you between the different concourses. Because the airport is mostly outside, it's easy for them to have native gardens where you can walk around or sit for a while while you wait for your flight. 
Being outside is also fun because you get good views of airplanes at the gates, like ours for example, which is sitting here at gate D1. It's a 19 year old 737-800 currently based in Guam. This enclosed gate area started off with a passport check considering that we were technically boarding an international flight even if we weren't actually going to be leaving the airports. Using gates with this setup helps because then they have all the documents checked and when it's time to board, they only have to scan boarding passes and assure you of the proper mark that was given to your boarding pass when they checked your documents, allowing you into the gate area. So that way there isn't a big bottleneck at the boarding gate entrance, therefore allowing boarding to be completed quicker and on time. Now the planes that serve the Guam base and other Pacific routes are on rotations. This plane has been based in Guam doing flights around the Pacific for at least the past 6 months since that's as far back as I can see, but at some point it will be brought back to the mainland since extended periods around the saltwater can cause deterioration of the airframe and engines at a quicker rate. The other thing I've noticed from other videos of this route as well is they don't seem to place the renovated interior 737s on this route, it's always the ones with the outdated seats and entertainment, and I definitely have more on that later. Today we're going to be sitting in United's Economy Plus seating, which offers a couple extra inches of legroom, which I was fully hoping to take advantage of on this long journey. I was trying to also get my footage of the seat before it all filled up, as pretty much every leg was just short of 100% full. Interestingly enough, there was probably about 50% locals, but the rest were a fairly even split between tourists to the intermittent islands and a good amount of aviation enthusiasts. The only people that actually made the full journey, however, were definitely the aviation lovers since there is a non-stop flight that can get you to Guam in half the time. Now the seat itself, which is just the same as a normal economy seat, just with a tad more room for your knees. The seat has about an inch of cushion on it, which is fairly normal for most economy seats these days. And now a look at the leg room, I'm 5'9 for your reference, you can see there's about 6 inches between my knees and the seat in front of me. We will look at the entertainment a bit more later, but you can see that rather than a touch screen, the control is on the armrest, which is unfortunate because if you plan to rest your arm on the armrest, you have to be careful not to change the volume, channel, or brightness. In addition, if we assume the middle seat gets both armrests because of airplane etiquette, they will commonly accidentally mess with your controls without even trying or noticing just by resting their arm there. There's also two universal charging ports for every three seats in economy, which is a game changer in this flight and you'll see exactly why that is shortly once we're in the air. Now this 19 year old airplane also has 19 year old overhead panels complete with individual air outlets which is nice considering that even in the winter the weather at these places is warm and humid at best, definitely can get pretty sweaty. Another fun thing about the Guam based aircraft doing hops around the Pacific is that they have signage in both English and Japanese since Guam operates these 737s to multiple Asian destinations as well. We also had to check out the lavatory on this airplane before people are using it for 15 hours without servicing. Interestingly enough, the restroom seems to have been renovated much more recently than the rest of the cabin, so I'm wondering why they didn't just continue on with the rest of the cabin when they did the restroom.
One of the things I observed to pass the time was enjoying how shiny and reflective the cowling's leading edge was, as the flight continued to got less and less shiny, but we can keep an eye on that as we go on. Now the first leg from Honolulu to Majuro was by far the longest leg at about five to five and a half hours. We were served just two meals in total for the journey. The first was breakfast served about 30 minutes into our first leg. Breakfast for the economy cabin included a French twist breakfast sandwich, Greek yogurt, and a granola bar. I also opted to get a coffee, first of many for this journey, so that I could stay awake and take in the full experience. It was also about this time we realized we had a problem. The problem lied in the in-flight entertainment system. It just kept restarting and loading, but nothing ever actually played. This shouldn't have been an issue because United also has personal device entertainment, which would have been great if the aircraft had working Wi-Fi. This was made worse with the fact that I hadn't downloaded any content since the United app said I would have seatback and personal device entertainment on board. This was even further made worse because my new plan was to download something at one of our stops, but I was unable to get any type of service until I landed in Guam. This meant that I had no entertainment or contact with the outside world for 15 hours. Talk about being forced into the fully immersive experience. So what do you do when your main sources of entertainment were taken and all you have out the window is an endless eyeline of water? Of course you take out the Hemispheres magazine since United is one of the few airlines still offering in-flight magazines. The next problem to tackle is how to solve my curiosity about where we actually are. Answer? Use Google Maps. And if you zoom out enough, the map will load and you can get GPS through satellite, although it's spotty, but it's better than being in the dark when your curiosity is killing you. Fortunately, I had been playing around with the Apple Maps for our route, so Majuro was already loaded in. No internet required. The descent to Majuro was welcome, since I was excited to try and get back into the outside world. Majuro is the capital city of the Marshall Islands, despite the atoll having less than 4 square miles of space, and a large portion of that being taken up by the international airport located there. Well that small little landmass you see there is the capital city of the Marshall Islands. And if I'm estimating, the runway was probably about 150 feet wide, and there's only about 50 feet on either side of it.
approximately 10.34. Please stay comfortably seated until the seatbelt sign is turned off. You may continue to use and charge your phones and tablets. If you're seated next to the exit row, please don't plug your device into the outlets. Don't forget to check your seatback pockets. We arrived to Majuro about an hour late due to an issue loading bags in Honolulu, and we were scheduled for a 35 minute turn. Personally, I was curious to see how they could pull that off. Even though there wasn't that many passengers staying or ending their journey there, they did still have to get bags loaded and unloaded for those passengers, and on top of that we had to take fuel for the next leg since we only had enough fuel for each leg at a time. Even still, about three quarters of the passengers elected to get out and stretch their legs in the small airport terminal, if you can even call it that. It's really more of just a bus shack with a TSA. The terminating passengers were taken to the right through immigration and the transiting passengers were taken to the left into the terminal building. Once inside we could see the 50 or so seats and a snack shack but a good selection of way overpriced food and drink for those who didn't plan ahead. I fall into that category but I wasn't about to pay $30 for a crappy looking fish sandwich. Biscoff cookies were plenty to power me all the way to Guam. To my surprise, we were actually boarding within about 5-10 to 10 minutes of getting inside. Maybe our 35 minute turn is going to work out. Majuro is also where I got talking to Zach, another aviation enthusiast who was here for the entire journey, so if you're watching this Zach, what's up? Back inside the aircraft however, troubles and delays began again. As it turns out, the rain had damaged the fueling mechanism that they used to fuel the aircraft and they weren't able to get any fuel put in the aircraft, and we didn't have enough to make it to Kwajalein with enough extra for any diversions that might become necessary. The good thing is for this flight, they're required to carry a tech ops worker. I got a chance to talk to ours on the final leg. He told me this because they don't have maintenance personnel at these small airports and so they bring someone along for any issues that may arise. He said he loves it because he gets paid to sleep for 15 hours, only has to wake up every so often for a half hour at our stops. Then he gets a few days in Guam and does the reverse flight, but that's him right there, he's the real MVP. We did get some good news though, no in-flight entertainment yet, but they were at least able to get the map booted up. The nice thing about these small airports is there's virtually no taxi. You start the engines basically without needing pushback, and you're at the runway. The only issue today is that we were departing from the other direction, but this did afford us a good view of one of the Air Marshall Islands Dash 8s and Air Marshall Islands Super Small Maintenance Hangar. Now the map was good to have, but I wanted to get crafty with the entertainment I had. So what next? Play whatever games you have downloaded on your phone, which, side note, isn't very many. That means we played a lot of this, played a little bit of this, and we played a whole load of this.
Before long, we were descending into Kwajalein. This ended up being our shortest leg of the day at about 25 minutes. Kwajalein is a military field, so they didn't want us getting any videos of any personnel or while we were on the ramp, and it also meant we weren't allowed off at this stop, in which bags were unloaded with a pallet and a forklift, as opposed to a normal baggage cart. Kwajalein is slightly larger of an atoll than Majuro by about one square mile, but most of the island is US military, who just call it Kwaj for short. Out of Quaj and on to our next airport and country, the next stop on our tour is Kosre, which is a member of the Federated States of Micronesia. We were given a snack service on this flight, no choices of snacks, just some almonds, and we were given a choice of beverage. This leg of our journey was a bit less than an hour. Unfortunately, the crew had advised us that since we were running late, they wanted all transiting passengers to remain on board. I was bummed thinking out I was missing part of the experience by not getting off, but the tech ops guy on board assured me that this flight is almost always running late, and that being stuck on board is the experience. Regardless, the island was finally on my side of the aircraft, so I got some wonderful views of this amazing surf spot on our approach.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Koshrai. We'll be taxed for just a few moments. Please remain comfortably seated while the seatbelt sign is on. Once we're safely parked, our captain will turn the seatbelt sign off. You may continue to use and charge your telephones and tablets. If you are seated in an exit row, we do ask that you do not plug it into the charger ports at this time. We pulled into the terminal at Coast Ray about an hour and 20 minutes behind schedule. We were also scheduled for another 35 minute turn again, however it ended up taking us about 55 minutes due to what seemed like trouble loading a large number of surfboards on board. I did end up meeting a guy from the town adjacent to my hometown at this stop, which was kind of a small, small world. It was kind of frustrating though, however, considering that we started to make up time in the air just to have it all taken away from us again once we're back on the ground. It was fun going into some of these airports and having small crowds of people watching. Some were picking up or dropping off passengers, but some just wanted to see the airplane since it wasn't here every day. Now this route was operated by a branch of Continental Airlines for a long time. If you don't believe me, here's an old cargo container still sitting on the ramp with the Continental branding. Now the staff of these airports seem to work at a pretty leisurely pace for sure, considering our turn times were nearly doubled at each stop, but my goodness were they friendly. It seemed they knew most of the locals, so they weren't shy to strike up conversations, and for the aviation enthusiasts it seems like they were just enjoying having such interested people around. The service also gives a good amount of work to otherwise small communities that don't have great employment, but every stop they gathered each time to wave us off. No snacks on the flight from Coast Ray to Pompeii, but they did come around for drink services. I did also find out from my new friend in business class that this leg they finally started running out of the glass cups and had to start using the same plastic cups as economy. It makes me wonder why people just can't reuse their glasses in business class to save the plastic. This however was another short flight so after a short bit we were on our approach into Pompeii, another island on my side of the aircraft so we got a nice little air tour on arrival. Now the island state of Pompeii is actually home to Palakir, which is the capital of Micronesia. Of the islands we visited in Micronesia, three of them are island states as part of the country.
Surprisingly enough, they did let us off in Pompeii despite being about an hour and 45 minutes late. Makes me wonder if there is some sort of regulation that makes it so they have to let us off every so often, or if they're just being courteous. That being said, nobody's on this flight if they're short of time. If you're here, you know that it's a marathon. Pompeii was possibly the largest of the island airports. I mean, it had a whole second gate. Inside, they even had a restaurant, looked closed however, and a room marked VIP lounge. That was really just full of employees. Didn't matter too much because just like the last time we got off, we were back boarding in about 10 to 15 minutes. Another common issue to run into that causes delays on these flights is having to be released for your IFR plan. Considering all these airports don't have control towers, they have to get the release for your IFR departure from the control center. That can take a little while and if there's aircraft in the vicinity, although there usually isn't, but it can cause some delays on departure. This happened to us a couple times on this journey, each time delaying us by about another 10 to 20 minutes. Chuuk was our last island state in Micronesia before we continued on to Guam. On this flight from Pompeii to Chuuk, we weren't given any more snacks, but we were given a drink option. I decided to just go with some carbonated water. And here you can see my beloved shiny cowling, just getting a little bit less shiny if you refer back to the early on clips. Now everyone on board was starting to get a little bit tired, the sun was starting to set, and this is our last stop before we got to our final destination of Guam. Now at Chuuk, we also were not allowed off the aircraft, this was more for COVID restrictions, only those who were staying on the island were actually allowed to deplane. The rest of us stayed on board for this final stop.
Kachuk will be taxiing for a few moments. Please remain comfortably seated. Once we're safely parked at the gate, seatbelt sign is turned off for those leaving us. We do remind you to check for all items you're traveling with, overhead bins, scarf closets, and seat pockets. Once the seatbelt sign is turned off, we do ask that you please stand clear of the doors. This will allow our flight attendants to complete their final report and safety duties. We'll be turning it over to our airport team. Now, when we landed in Chuuk and I was able to check the time, we were officially two hours and 15 minutes behind schedule, closing in on two and a half hours. It is kind of frustrating considering that, obviously, the crew moves a little bit slower at these airports, which is fine, but don't allow for 35 minute turns. In all honesty, none of our turns were 35 minutes. I'd say the quickest was probably 45 to 55 minutes. Had United planned for this, they would have had a little bit more accurate of a time. I got bit in the butt by this when we got to Guam, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you are doing this flight, definitely plan to fly out of Guam at the earliest the next morning. Now we were given a blessing though in the sense that the in-flight entertainment system got fixed for our final leg to Guam. Now that means I can finally give you an actual review on the old 737-800 entertainment systems on United. That being said, if I ever complain about an in-flight entertainment system again, just remind me that this exists. Like we mentioned earlier, it's not touchscreen, so you have to use the remote on the armrest, which we've already talked about the drawbacks of that earlier in this video. Now let's talk about the content that's on there. How United's system works on these airplanes, they basically have eight channels, and each of those channels has some movie playing. However, every time the airplane is restarted, the movie starts over. So if you did have the in-flight entertainment for this full journey, you wouldn't be able to actually get into a movie because every single leg was only about half hour to an hour, and then you'd have to restart everything from scratch. And on that same note, you didn't actually get to choose when the process started. Whenever they turn the system on, all the movies begun, and when you switch that channel, you just kind of picked up wherever it was at that time not the greatest in-flight entertainment option, so I ended up actually sticking mostly with the map because there wasn't really any movies that interested me. Now the sun was setting on us here which was a little bit depressing considering we were originally supposed to be in Guam before the sun had set. By the time we arrived in Guam we were a little under three hours behind schedule according to my rough calculation after our departure from Chuuk. Now they did actually give us a full meal service on this final flight which was nice. We had the full in-flight entertainment and meal service that we thought we'd have the whole way. 
Now the meal service, it was kind of funny because they hadn't really been giving us too many meals. And so as soon as they gave everyone these chicken sandwiches, you could hear wrappers ferociously being unwrapped throughout the entire cabin. In addition, they had also started running out of certain soft drinks. It seemed like Coke and Sprite they were pretty much out of. And so I ended up going with a coffee considering when I got to Guam, I had another connecting flight that I had to try and make. So my day wasn't quite over yet. Now, I was kind of excited to see Guam, considering that it's a U.S. territory that I've never been to, but considering it was dark, you get to enjoy the same dark view I had with the few little lights that do appear on the island. Now, here's a quick story about how I got screwed at the end of the day. I was leaving a three hour gap in order to make my connecting flight, which went through Palau, ending in Manila so I could get back to San Francisco. Upon arrival, considering that we were just under three hours late, I got the message that they were boarding our flight basically as I was going through immigration, but they had a United agent come to immigration specifically to announce that they were not going to hold the airplane for us. I ended up still trying to go to TSA considering that in all honesty I would have made it before the boarding doors closed, but they had completely shut down TSA and weren't allowing anybody else through it, which was kind of a bummer. So I went to the check-in desk and talked to them as did everybody else on my flight that was connecting, and as it turns out there was about 80 or so people that were actually on my flight connecting to my following flight to Manila, which means that that plane couldn't have taken off more than half full, which just seems bizarre that they didn't hold the airplane, but they said the order came from Chicago and they ended up having to get all of us hotel reservations and rebook us, so they had to have ended up losing money in the long run, but either way, lesson is learned, if you are doing this flight, give yourself an overnight at the very least when you get to Guam, because you will run out of time otherwise. post-flight reflection, I honestly don't think it's fair to judge it the same as I judge other flights because this flight was a full experience. It was not just the flight itself. This was obviously a huge bucket list item of mine. I was super happy to have gotten it done. And if you guys get the chance to, I highly recommend it. Now, here's the thing with United. I think that they definitely need to fix their in-flight service on this. Having these old airplanes that don't have in-flight entertainment or Wi-Fi or anything like that, when you potentially have these people on an airplane for 15 hours, just doesn't quite sit right with me. I feel like giving them some sort of alternative option to watch this entertainment, give them iPads, give them something so that they have something to pass the time, especially for the people who may not be as into aviation and aren't just there for the journey. I wasn't totally thrilled about that. Now, the other thing with United that I wish they would change about this is the scheduling. Now, obviously, even the tech ops guys know that this flight's always late. They can't make the turns in time, they always have little things go wrong, and I think United needs to factor that into the scheduling. Whether people have connecting flights or not at the end of this journey, I just think that's something to be fixed. 
But regardless, once in a lifetime opportunity, I totally enjoyed going to all of these airports along the way, and I hope you enjoyed coming along the journey with me. I honestly would do it again if presented the opportunity, maybe in business class next time, and maybe with some more in-flight entertainment myself. But thank you all for watching. Stay tuned for more videos next time. Peace.